OK. So I want to talk about what happens when I add together the displacement with the ohmic current normalized by j omega. As is, this presumably looks like a reasonably arbitrary idea. But there's a method behind the madness here. This displacement is a measure of how much polarization we have. This current, and, and this displacement is by polarization of the individual atoms or molecules. This ohmic current is a measure of how fast things are polarizing. So this I can think of as polarization. This, or let's see, let me be more specific and call this the amount of polarization. This ohmic current is really the rate at which ions are polarizing. And by polarizing, I don't mean that the individual ion is polarizing, but rather the ion is moving, causing a net polarization of the system. <clears throat> so displacement is the amount of polarization. If I have a phaser, and I take the derivative of it, how does that change the, the quantity? So if I take the derivative of uh, something times exponential j omega t, what's the algebraic uh, relation that describes what I get? So if I take ddt, of exponential j omega t, what do I get? Right. In fact, this was the whole reason why I went to an analytic representation and phase notation. Taking the derivative amounts to just multiplying something times j omega. Right? So here I have the amount of polarization. If I multiply this times j omega, I would get the rate at which this is polarizing. Here I have the rate at which the system is polarizing because of the motion of ions. If I divide by j omega, I'm basically integrating it. Right? So these two things, this is describing how the ions are moving and creating polarization. This is an instantaneous measure of how much things have already polarized. These two things are basically related by this derivative. These two things in an, in an oscillating electrical system are 90 degrees out of phase. So why might I combine them this way? Well, let's take Gauss's law of electricity. And let's look at the charge conservation equation. So this charge conservation a equation, as I've written it, assumes that there's no flow. And it assumes further that there's no diffusion. So this will work well, assuming that our electric fields are moving fast relative to the flow. 
and are moving fast relative to diffusional processes. Well, if I take the time derivative of this phaser, what do I get? I take ddt of rho e naught. What is that equal to? Something times rho e naught. J omega. If I divide both sides by j omega, Now this becomes minus rho e naught. This becomes the divergence of sigma e over j omega. So the divergence of the electric displacement phasor is the net charge density phasor. The displacement of the current phasor divided by a j omega is the opposite of that. So what happens when I add this together to this and take the divergence of it? I get nothing. Zero. So what this all means Uh, too small. What this all means is that if I take the divergence of all of this, that's equal to zero. And this is comparable what I had to what I had in a purely dielectric system. In a purely dielectric system, or to be precise, a purely dielectric system with no no charge in the bulk and no charge at the interface, I was able to just solve Laplace's equation, right? I mean, del dot d is equal to zero is equivalent to epsilon del squared phi is equal to zero. This is what I solved to get that solution for dielectrophoresis. But if I try to do this with something that's conducting, now there's, there's a whole, I got a whole bunch of problems. I have charge being created at the surface because of the imbalance of the electric field. I have charge being created at the surface because of the imbalance of the conductances. I have charge being, I have these two different charges both in existence at the surface. That changes what governing equation, and in particular what boundary condition I can apply at the surface. So if I want to go from the dielectric solution and just magically go to the case where I have conductivity, what happens is my boundary condition becomes a pain. Because my conductivity tells me that charge is being created at the interface. I have free charge at the interface because I have ions moving from the outside and they're hitting the interface, and those ions aren't being translated in through this particle. So I want to apply this boundary condition at the interface that epsilon times the normal electric field on one side is equal to epsilon times the normal electric field on the other side. That's what I did to solve the Laplace equation when we first did this. I want to apply that boundary condition. But if you work it all out, if you, tr if you add in, uh, if you allow the particle and the medium to be conductive, all that stuff falls apart. Unless you put the two governing equations together in a way to make all your problems go away. By putting together 
the electric displacement d naught with the ohmic current normalized by j omega, I get the divergences of these two to cancel. That means that when I solve the phasor equations, remember that everything here is still linear, which means I can use the phasor equations. Now I can take the divergence of this whole quantity, the electric displacement plus ohmic current normalized by j omega, the divergence of that is equal to zero. When I apply the boundary conditions for this at the interface, now all I have to do is I have to change the thing I multiply by the electric field. So for purely dielectric, where the bulk charge is zero, and where the charge at the interface is equal to zero, the bulk equation I solved was del dot d is equal to zero, and my boundary conditions were that epsilon p d phi d r, uh, let's see, epsilon p d phi d r on the inside, was equal to epsilon m d phi d r times the outside. That's what I did last time. <clears throat> so now, I have an electric displacement that's given by epsilon times E. I have an ohmic current that's given by omega, sorry, sigma over J omega times E. And that means that this whole thing is given by this expression. And this we call the complex permittivity. And we denote this epsilon with the squiggle underneath. So the squiggle means that it's complex. This is not an analytic representation of things. It's a complex number that has a real part that describes the real and instantaneous reactive response, and an omega over, or a sigma over j omega, which describes the phase lagged ohmic lossy dissip dissipative response. So, for purely dielectric, I solved del dot d is equal to zero. This is basically Laplace's equation. I applied the boundary condition that epsilon times the electric field normal to the surface on the inside was equal to epsilon m times the electric field normal to the surface on the outside. If it's conductive, I solve this equation and my boundary condition looks like this. So I write, I'm solving the equations in terms of the phasors. The key parameters that go in are now not just the permittivity, but rather this complex permittivity, which is basically a sum of the real and imaginary parts, a sum of the reactive and dissipative components of the responses. <clears throat>
because these are complex, now when I go back to that force solution, that force solution is going to have a key component that's going to be complex. And our force itself can't be complex. 